Following on from our video on the potential interest from the ruling Saudi Arabia family, the Al Saud family, in buying Manchester United, and our chat with David Conn from The Guardian on the Glazers and whether they would actually sell Manchester United, we're going to be discussing a very important topic today. Now, the Saudi Arabia regime is currently embroiled in controversy over the disappearance and death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, and no Manchester United fan can ignore the international outcry at what is going on at the moment. So to discuss that situation and to offer some insight into the human rights concerns that United fans do have to take into account when it comes to any potential takeover from the Al Saud family, I'm joined today by human rights researcher Nick McGeehan, who wrote an excellent piece on Manchester City and their owners back in 2017 looking into those issues. So thank you very much today, Nick, for joining me. Thanks for having me. That's no problem at all, but as I said, let's get straight into it. Now, can, for, for those that don't know, Nick, can you please um, sort of give a brief overview of, of how Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman took power in Saudi Arabia and the rise to power that he did have? Sure. Um, I mean, Saudi Arabia is traditionally had a very complex ruling system. It's, as you said, it's run by this one ruling family, the, the Al Saud, hence, hence the name Saudi Arabia. Um, but power used to be um, distributed across various individuals. It was never really concentrated by, by one person. That really changed when, when Mohammed bin Salman, who's, who's typically referred to as MBS, came to power. Now, he's not the king yet. Um, his, his father is the king, but his father is very old. He's in his 80s. And uh, MBS was appointed Crown Prince in June 2017. And shortly after that, he he effectively, um, I mean, you can't really call it a coup because he already held power, but he stripped um, many other ministers of their power. Um, he basically did a shakedown of, of many of the country's leading businessmen. He held them prisoner in the Ritz-Carlton uh, in Riyadh. Um, and he, he centralised all the power um, uh, to himself, basically, he was a power grab. Um, so, um, and, and since then, we've seen, you know, as you as you referenced, the the dreadful case of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, but basically, what we have now in Saudi Arabia is a situation where, where he's effectively a dictator. Uh, now, Saudi never had a particularly good human rights record. Um, it's, it's typically a bit of a bogeyman where that issue is concerned. But the the signs now are particularly ominous um, where where rights are concerned. There. Now. As you said, Mohammed bin Salman and the Saudi regime are currently embroiled in controversy over the death and disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi. Now, Saudi Arabia's foreign minister, uh, Adel al Jabir has gone on record to say that Khashoggi was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Now, having two weeks earlier said that he originally left the consulate unharmed, uh, blamed it on a rogue operation, uh, said that those responsible did so outside of their own authority. Now, the UK, France and Germany have all denounced the death and called for facts to back up the story because reports in Turkey claim that he was interrogated, that he was tortured and murdered. They say they have audio and video evidence to back that up, but it is currently unreleased. Now, it's a completely murky situation with riddled with doubt, riddled with allegations and accusations, which will continue to develop. You know, how serious is this Khashoggi situation and, and what impact do you expect it to have on both Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman himself. It's dreadfully serious. Um, as I said, you know, the, the country has a, a, has a dreadful human rights record. Numerous people have been disappeared. Numerous people have been tortured in prison. Um, but for this to happen in such a naked fashion, for it to be done uh, so openly, I mean, he, you, you don't do something like this unless you, you know that you're going to be caught. You, you do it to send a message. Um, so this man was assumed to have been tortured and, and murdered in the most gruesome fashion uh, as a means of MBS sending a message to his foes and, and presenting himself as this strong man. So it's incredibly serious. It's an incredible misjudgment, uh, the response from various governments and, and many newspapers around the world has just been horror. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's really put the, the reputation of the country, which was already a bit shaky, but it's put its reputation with many of its supporters and allies and backers in serious jeopardy. Um, now, you know, bear in mind that Saudi Arabia, in fact, MBS launched a disastrous war uh, in Yemen when he was defence minister in 2015, and that's led to the deaths of thousands of people, including women and children. Hospitals and schools and funerals and weddings have all been bombed. Now that campaign, he was managed. You know, he managed to keep a hold of his um, his reputation and his allies all through that. But this case, this this murder of a journalist, has really, um, as I said, a terrible misjudgment as well as a gruesome crime. 
It really, really is. Um, no, should 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 United fans be worried about the club potentially getting involved with Saudi Arabia and when the Khashoggi mystery is still completely unresolved? And obviously, the money would certainly come from being overtaken by the Al Saud regime. They're worth 850 billion. Uh, any deal that was would to go through is probably be in the region of three to four billion. So it's it's small money for them. But are there other things that United fans should be considering? when it comes to any potential takeover from the Al Saud regime? I think so, yeah. I mean, this is something I've been harping on about for a while now. Um, I mean, the first thing to, to say, I think, is United already have some commercial arrangements with Saudi, um, but those are fairly low level. Now, that's not to excuse those. Um, you know, I'm not a fan, personally, of, of clubs being in relationships, however big or small, with, with, um, with these governments. But ownership is a different matter. Um, ownership take things to, to, to a new level. I was chatting to somebody, a journalist, about this recently and I was scratching my head saying I can't think of a worse thing that could happen to football generally, not just to Manchester United as a club. Uh, I think it would be a disaster for Manchester United as a club. I think it would be a disaster for Manchester as a city and I think it would be a disaster for the game as a whole um, because these people are, I mean as the murder of Khashoggi shows, that, that, that lays bare uh, the types of people we're dealing with here um, and football clubs are important, they're cultural, they're societal institutions, the game's important and it's too important to be uh, a plaything and a political tool for these governments in, in my view. I thought you, you brushed on what my next question was going to be there but you know if the Al Saud family did take over Manchester United and it was to go through, why do you think they would do it? What would be their main motivation and reason behind buying Manchester United? We'll, we'll look at City, um, look at look at what encouraged Abu Dhabi to get involved in, in City. Now, at this point, I think it's important to say that the people who, who run Abu Dhabi, um, they might not be as brutal, as bloodthirsty as MBS, but they're not far off it. Mohammed bin Zayed, who's the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, was a strong supporter of MBS when he was um, in line for, for power. Uh, he pushed him, he promoted him. Much of what MBS has done in Saudi Arabia, you could say, has echoes of what MBS has done in Abu Dhabi. Um, so the link between these two uh, is important, important to stress that. Um, but why are Abu Dhabi involved? Well, partly it's money, but, but I don't think it's primarily financial. It's about power. Um, it's about gaining a foothold in centres of political power. Um, and to an extent, it's about presenting an image of yourself as, as wholesome and liberal and progressive and tolerant, um, when the opposite is the case. Now, now, this is one of MBS's key strategies. It's why he was given a lot of support prior to this Khashoggi uh, incident, because he was seen as a reformer. And a reform meant all of these things. It meant presenting Saudi Arabia as something else, as not this backward country, but rather this forward-looking progressive country. And tourism, for example, was a key uh, component of the strategy. So to so look to City, look what City have done with Abu Dhabi and how that's presented there. And you can see how MBS would use Manchester United to present a similar face to Saudi Arabia. So you effectively see the purchase as more of a, a political tool to push the image of Saudi Arabia, sort of tying into that Saudi vision 2030, which uh, Bin Salman is heavily involved with, rather than anything to do with the club itself. Precisely. I mean, I, if, if, if it is true they're, involved, that they're interested, I think it would be a key component of that. Um, I mean, you, you can't take sort of inter, uh, inter gulf rivalry, you know, is a part of it. Maybe they just want, you know, the same sort of um, prominence that Abu Dhabi are getting or that the Qataris are getting with PSG, for example. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's more importantly um, and more obviously political. Now, um, United fans know firsthand just how much of an impact Man City's takeover has had on the pitch, you know, from their takeover 10 years ago to them winning multiple Premier League titles. It's abundantly obvious, but they may be, United fans are probably unaware of any allegations behind the scenes against their owners. You know, and as, as I've brushed on earlier, Nick, you wrote that article back in 2012 entitled The Men Behind Man City, a documentary not coming to a cinema near you, where you detailed a lot of this. What can you tell us about Manchester City's owners and what would your warnings be for any United fans that just look to any potential takeover from the Al Saud regime as just a way to get more money? Yeah, with, with City, I mean, I wrote that article, I think years of frustration of people not identifying who was actually running the club. It's always presented as being, you know, Sheikh Mansour, who was some, you know, benevolent sheikh, when in fact it was quite clearly a political move by the government of Abu Dhabi, who have an abysmal human rights record and who have personally been involved in numerous instances of outright criminality. 
so far from being these sort of progressive, wonderful uh, business partners, they're, they're something else entirely. Um, of course, it, it's it's uh, it's gold plated, you know, and it comes with lots of money involved, and they brought incredible success um, to Manchester City, which is which is why uh, City supporters or many of them are very hesitant. Uh, reluctant to, to to scratch the surface and look, look behind the the, the PR driven narrative, I guess. Um, what, what what lessons do United fans have? That success <laughs> in the modern era can come with a serious cost attached. Um, the cost is is the serious tarnishing of the reputation of the club. Um, if success is all you're interested in, if it trumps everything else, if you don't care where the money comes from, if you don't care whether it comes from the worst human rights abusers on the planet, then uh, then you don't have a problem. Um, but if your club to you represents something more than that, um, if it has a greater significance than that, if it stands for success, but success in a certain way, if it stands for some set of values that, that you think are important, then you really have to question where the money comes from. I mean, you, you have the Glazers in just now who are controversial figures who are you know, stripping money out of the club and, and I can totally understand why people um, have concerns with that and take serious issue with that and they should. But the Glazers aren't bombing Yemen. <laughs> Glazers aren't, you know, kidnapping journalists and mm. chopping their fingers off in, in embassies. Um, so while I can understand the haste to want to rid the club of, of people like the Glazers, I would counsel against welcoming anyone from the House of Saud into, into Manchester United. Yeah, so I suppose it's that that ground where you stand on whether, you, from a moral perspective, you really don't mind where the money comes from if you can just ignore that PR narrative, or whether, as you said, the club means something more to you, that it is based in society, that the image of Manchester United is something far more than just a successful football team. And United fans have to make that decision as to whether they would be happy to go from one side of the fence to the other, especially after 10 years of, of begrudging Man City and what they've been doing for it to then happen at Manchester United and to accept that it might be a strange situation but uh, you know as, as, you, as you pointed out in this video there's there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed and discussed this ongoing Khashoggi situation with Mohammed bin Salman with the Saudi regime it's murky something has gone on we don't know what the whole truth is at the moment but Turkey are threatening to release more information as it goes on so that will continue to develop. But thank you very much for your time today, Nick. And I hope this video has, has helped you understand a little bit more about what concerns United fans should be having about any potential takeover from the Al Saud regime. Because from a money perspective, the money's there. But from a human rights and moral perspective, there is more than one question to ask. So thank you very much for your time today, Nick. No, thanks. And, and listen, it's, it's really encouraging that you're, you're giving this coverage. I mean, the, a few years ago, people wouldn't be having these conversations, wouldn't be having these debates. So the fact that the people like you are talking about it and encouraging supporters to, to engage with it is very positive, in my view. Cool. Well, thank you very much for your time, Nick. Thanks.